We are going to be talking today about a river of joy. But before we get to that, let me remind you what we're doing here. Listen, and I know I keep saying this every Sunday, but as Peter wrote in the Bible, I'm going to keep reminding you because I think it's good for you to hear. God wants us to put our trust in him. That's what life is for a Christian, learning how to trust God and how to give him control every day. So no matter what's going on, I know the devil loves to use excuses. He loves to put into your mind reasons that you can't give God control, that you can't trust God. I, had a, I have a friend who, he was an alcoholic for 40 years before he turned his life over to Christ. And he used to say, I asked myself, what if I give God my life and he messes it up? That's kind of funny, but that's really our attitude a lot of times, isn't it? That's why we don't trust God. That's why we don't give him control, because we think we can do it better. So we don't follow everything that's in the scripture. Instead, we use our own wisdom and we say, I know better. The Bible says, be in church every Sunday. Ah, I don't need to do that. Let's just erase that part out of the Bible. There was a Christian comedy group back in the 80s, Isaac Air Freight, one of my favorite groups. And they did a skit once about the Ronco Bible. Any of you old people remember the Ronco commercials on TV? They, they had all kinds of different products. Everything you can think of, Ronco sold, and it was cheap and easy to use. Well, Isaac Air Freight did a skit called the Ronco Bible, where you could erase any of the words you want and write in whatever you wanted to be there. Now, that's funny, too, but... You know, a lot of people do that. We decide what we want to do. We decide what we think is best. And then that's how we live our lives. That's not living life as a Christian. No matter what is going on, don't listen to the devil. Put your trust in God. No matter what news you receive, you can trust God. God. So don't let the news persuade you. Just trust God. That's what we're talking about this entire year. And this is the scripture God gave us to meditate on for the whole year. Psalm 112.7. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. I think the kids have this all memorized. That's awesome. You know, Christians have no reason to fear anything in this world. We can confidently trust God to take care of us in any and every situation. As long as you're living the way that God told you to live, you have nothing to fear in this world all the way through to eternity because God's going to take care of you all the way to the end. In fact, there won't be an end. I can't even imagine that. There won't be an end. Wow. Whew. We've been studying Psalm 46 to learn who God is. And why we should trust Him. It's one thing for the pastor to stand up here and say, trust God. It's another thing for me to explain to you why you can. And so that's what we've been focused on. Here's the scripture we're going to look at starting today. Psalm 46, 4. A river and its streams bring joy to the city, which is the sacred home of God Most High. 
a river of joy. We're going to spend some time the rest of this month talking about this river and this city. But today, being Palm Sunday, I want to talk about something else that brought joy into God's city, Jerusalem, 2,000 years ago. And maybe this verse is talking symbolically about Palm Sunday. And maybe the river that brings joy into the city is Jesus. So here, with an explanation of what Palm Sunday is all about, the skit guys. Take a look. Hey, Tommy and Eddie here to talk to you about something really great, Palm Sunday. Yeah, that's the Sunday that we paint our palms purple to commemorate King Saul talking to that palm reader lady, and then we wave him in the air. <laughs> no, no it's not. Yes it is. No it's yes, not. Yes it no. is. What Bible do you read? Palm Sunday commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now picture this, Jesus rode in on a donkey while the crowds put their cloaks and palm branches all over the ground shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. That's what I said. What I meant. Okay, now picture this. Jesus' popularity was going viral. I mean, he just raised Lazarus from the dead in the same community just a few days earlier. Wait, post-dead Lazarus was maybe at the very first Palm Sunday? Yeah, probably. That's so cool. I bet if he was there, he was probably like, And you're a thriller, thriller, Jesus. You raised me from the dead when you said, Get up, get up, get up, ooh! Now, to complete all of this, Jesus needed a donkey. Now, you'd think that a king or a prince would ride in on a horse, but not Jesus. He knew the message that he wanted to send. You see, a donkey represents peace. Anybody riding a donkey represented peaceful intentions. Yeah, it says right here in Matthew 21, it says that Jesus sent two of his disciples to get him a donkey. Yeah. Hey, I wonder which two he sent. Mm, maybe Thomas. I doubt it. I bet he sent Andrew. Andrew would totally do that and probably Tony. I bet he said Andrew and Tony. Tony's not a disciple. Oh, sorry. Tony is. It's still not a disciple. What translation of the Bible do you read? Jesus needed a donkey, so he asked two disciples to go get him a donkey. He told them they would find one in town, tied there next to a colt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he says, untie them and bring them to me. And if somebody asks you about it, you tell them the Lord needs them? Jeez. Yeah. What? Well, Jesus just told his disciples to go steal a donkey for him. What Bible do you read? It doesn't say that at all. I can't figure this out. I mean, Jesus, he changed water into wine. Cool. He fed the 4,000. He fed right? the 5,000. What? He fed the 5,000. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Not the fourth. It's the 5,000. We're splitting hairs. I'm sorry. Jesus fed a large group of people, and that's cool. He, he healed people with leprosy. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and then boom, he's like, hey guys, go steal me a donkey. I'm just saying, I don't think that's very WWJD. The significance of Jesus riding on a donkey, which he did not steal, was to fulfill the prophecy that is found in Zechariah 9.9. Yeah, but the... And the king riding in on a lowly donkey with his way paved with palm branches. The palm branches symbolize triumph or victory. The what? The palm branches. The branch. Palm thought... branches, Palm Sunday. The... I thought it was the palm. They should call it Branch Sunday because that's confusing. We all have palms with us all the time. I just, I feel bad. I, I'm sorry, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a time for us to prepare our hearts for the agony of his passion and the joy of his resurrection. So this week, let's cover the road to the cross with our hearts, our souls, and our minds as we reflect on the final week of Jesus' life. And let's celebrate in anticipation the return of the King of Kings. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> All right, so here is the real story. The Sunday before Jesus was crucified, Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem riding on a donkey while people laid palm branches and coats in the path in the road ahead of him. So here, let's read the story from Matthew in the Bible. 
Matthew chapter 21. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus! the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Everything about this donkey ride was perfectly planned out by God to bring the greatest joy the world has ever known into Jerusalem, God's city. Every aspect of Jesus' ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday had special symbolism and was a fulfillment of prophecy. And if you can grasp it today, you can see our God is worthy of our trust. That's my challenge, is that I need to show you you can trust God through this story. One week from that day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, Jesus rose from the dead and changed our lives and our world forever. We call that day Easter Sunday. And we're going to be celebrating it here at Abundant Life next Sunday morning at 10.30 with an original play that will help us to understand Easter and how it is such a, a big part of our lives, we're going to learn that a little bit better next week. That's the goal. So invite your friends. It's, it's still amazing to me, though, how fickle people can be. I mean, think about this. On that original Palm Sunday, crowds of people. Matthew says a very large crowd. Some historians believe that it was as many as two million people that welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem that day. And the way they welcomed him that donkey ride, the palm branches, their coats, was as they would welcome a king. Which is fitting since he is the king of all kings, right? But four days later, that Thursday, Jesus was arrested. And at his trial, if you can call it that, that same crowd of people that were calling him their king and welcoming him with joy, were crying just as loudly for his death. How could that happen? People celebrating Jesus on Sunday and then denying him a few days later. Hmm. Sound familiar? See, people still do that every week. Anytime we go to church on Sunday and worship Him and then spend the next week doing all the things that He died to erase from our lives, we're the same as that crowd. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says, if you keep on sinning after you realize what Jesus did, you are crucifying him all over again. God requires a total commitment. That is what being a Christian is. Not going to church sometimes. And that's what we're talking about. Learning to trust God with our entire lives. With everything we have. Christians need to learn to trust God with everything in our daily lives. 
We need to live the way he told us to live and trust he'll take care of everything else. When you stop and think about it, every sin is because we think God's not going to give us something we want. Hmm. When you tell a lie, it's because you think if you leave it to God, something bad's going to happen to you. So you got to take control and tell a lie. Any sin is because we are taking back control because we don't trust God with our lives. That's really what it comes down to. You know, giving God control of our lives is how we will experience this river of joy that Psalm 46.4 talks about. All right, so we were talking about a river that brings joy, as opposed to the water that floods or the seas that roar and foam, as, was, as is described earlier in Psalm 46 that we've been talking about the last couple of months. This river brings joy to where God lives. That's what Psalm 46.4 says, right? Everybody with me? All right. How to experience this river of joy. And if you have your handout that came in your bulletin, or if you're following along on our church app, here's your first fill in the blank. To experience the river of joy, number one, you must believe. You must believe. Believe, to experience the joy that God offers freely, you must believe in everything about Jesus, who He is, what He did, how He's involved in your life today, all of that. This is so important. You can see how the people on the first Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, reacted to him. What you may not see or may not understand that I'm hopefully going to explain to you today that you'll never forget it, is the symbolism that helped them to react to him the way that they did. In fact, I want to read to you the words from William Barclay. Because he describes this so well. He's one of my favorite Bible commentators, most of you know. This is what he said. It was, this ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, was a deliberate claim to be king. A deliberate fulfilling of the picture in Zechariah 9.9. In fact, let's read that right now. Rejoice greatly, O my people. Shout with joy, for look, your king is coming. He is the righteous one, the victor. Yet he is lowly, riding on a donkey's colt. Back to William Barclay. But even in this, Barclay writes, Jesus underlined the kind of kingship which he claimed. The donkey in Palestine was not the lowly beast that it is in this country. It was noble. Only in war did kings ride a horse. When they came in peace, they came upon a donkey. So Jesus, by this action came as a king of love and peace, not as the conquering military hero. Riding a donkey into Jerusalem was a sign to everyone there that Jesus was claiming to be king. See, this wasn't just some guy riding the donkey into Jerusalem. The people there understood this guy is claiming to be 
the Messiah. He is saying he is our king. Only he was coming in peace. Not the conquering hero that the Jews thought the Messiah would be. See, because at this point in history, Israel had been taken over by the Romans. They were conquered. And the Jews at this time in history and for the last couple of hundred years were thinking, this is the perfect time for the Messiah to come. We are captive in our own country by these conquering heroes that come, came in, destroyed us in war, took us captive, and now the Messiah should come and he should come in power and just strike them all dead. And make the Jews the greatest people in the world. Conquering everybody else, being in charge of everything. See, that's the way they thought. But Jesus didn't come riding on a horse. He came riding on a donkey. He was coming to save them. But not in the way they expected. I mean, even the city was symbolic. It had to be Jerusalem. Let me read what Matthew Henry had to say, another of my favorite Bible commentators. All the four Gospels, he says, take notice of this passage of Christ's riding in triumph into Jerusalem five days before his death. The Passover was on the 14th day of the month, and this was the 10th, on which day the law appointed that the sacrificial lamb should be taken up and set apart for that service. Let me interrupt Matthew Henry for a second. So you understand what we're talking about here. The Passover, which is what the last plague that happened in Egypt. You remember the ten plagues? This was the last one where God killed all the firstborn sons of all the Egyptians. But he passed over the Israelites. So they celebrated as God had told them to do every year. Passover. And one of the things that God had told them is to take a lamb, a perfect spotless lamb, very detailed instructions in the Old Testament on how they were to choose this lamb. And on this day, four days before Passover, the Passover meal, bring this lamb into your family, into your home. Let everybody see this is the sacrificial lamb. It was on that day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. Let me get back to Matthew Henry. On that day, therefore, Christ, our Passover lamb, who was to be sacrificed for us, was publicly showed. So that this was the prelude to his passion. Yet once in his life, he rode in triumph. And it was now when he went into Jerusalem to suffer and die. You see, Jerusalem was chosen on purpose. Jesus was to become a sacrifice a few days later to pay the debt for the whole world's sins for all history. Jerusalem was the only city in the world in which God allowed sacrificial offerings to himself to be offered. God had chosen Jerusalem 1,500 years before Jesus was born. Let's read about that in, the, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 5 and 6. Soon you will cross the Jordan, and the Lord will help you conquer your enemies and let you live in peace. There in the land he has given you, but after you are settled, life will be different. You must not offer sacrifices just anywhere you want to. Instead, the Lord will choose a place somewhere in Israel where you must go to worship Him. And that place was Jerusalem. 
So Jesus rode into town four days before the Passover lamb was sacrificed. Little did the people know Jesus would take the place of that lamb and become the sacrifice for their sins and the sins of the rest of the world for all time. But on that day, they did believe he was something special. And they honored him as their king. You might remember from the Matthew's version we just read, they shouted, Hosanna! Special significance to that word. Back to William Barclay. Hosanna means save now. And it was the cry for help which a people in distress addressed to their king or God. Essentially, it is a people's cry for deliverance and for the help in the day of their trouble. It is an oppressed people's cry to their savior and their king. Then they shouted the phrase, Hosanna in the highest! Which must mean, let even the angels in the highest heights of heaven cry unto God, save now. Listen, in order to experience this river of joy that Psalm 46.4 talks about, you must first believe all of this. It's absolutely necessary. John 3.36 Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Let me read that again. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But those who do not obey the Son will never have that life. They cannot get away from God's anger. You see, that's what Jesus did when He died on the cross. He took God's anger away from us. The anger that God has over sin, over disobedience, Jesus took that away. So that when God looks at us who believe, He doesn't see our sin. So He has no reason to be angry with us. But, only for those who believe. And Jesus explained right here what it means to believe. It means you must obey. So much for people that say, well, I asked Jesus to forgive my sins when I was a kid, so I'm going to heaven. (laughs) That's not what Jesus said, is it? See, if you believe, it will change your life. That's what believe means. I I want to make this a focus of our prayers this week, Monday and Tuesday. Focus on your faith. In Jesus. How great is your faith? Do you really trust God? Why? Ask yourself this week, why do I believe in Jesus? Look for ways that He has proven Himself to you. And spend time thanking Him for helping you believe so that you can experience this river of joy that God promises. All right, we got the believe out of the way. Everybody got that, right? First thing, you got to believe to experience the river of joy. What about the second thing? Let's look at number two. You must repent. See, if you stop at just believing... That Jesus rode into donkey, rode a donkey into Jerusalem. That Jesus died on the cross. You'll never have that joy. 
you must repent. See, these people understood this, that had had welcomed Jesus on that first Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. How do I know that? Because the palm branches and the coats that they laid on the road in front of Jesus symbolized that they were laying their own lives down their own possessions, everything they owned before Him as their King. They were symbolically saying, we surrender everything to you, Jesus. Matthew Henry put it this way. Note, those that take Christ for their King must lay their all under His feet. The clothes in token of the heart, For when Christ comes, though not when anyone else comes, it must be said to the soul, bow down that he may go over. What an awesome thought. We all must lay down everything if we want to experience God's joy. As Christians... We surrender the kingdoms of our lives to Jesus, and we make Him our King. That's what Palm Sunday symbolizes, making Jesus your King. And not just once, but over and over as these people did that day. Robertson's Word Pictures of the New Testament puts it this way, when the colt had passed over their garments, they would pick the garments up and spread them again before. See, the truth is, God has been asking people to repent as many times as necessary to completely surrender their lives to Him since the very beginning. Listen to what, what God said almost 3,000 years ago. This is in Joel, in the Old Testament, chapter 2. Yet even now, says the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, crying in sorrow and eating no food. Tear your heart and not your clothes. Return to the Lord your God, for He is full of loving kindness and loving pity. He is slow to anger, full of love, and ready to keep His punishment from you. That's our God. Today, it is just as important that we repent of all our wrongdoing and lay our lives down in surrender to Jesus. If you want to have joy, it is absolutely necessary for you to repent of your sins. And repent doesn't just mean saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It means turning away from them. Don't do them anymore. Leave them behind. Leave them in the grave where Jesus put them when he died on the cross. Acts 2.38 And Peter said to them, Repent! Change your old way of thinking. Turn from your sinful ways. Accept and follow Jesus as the Messiah And be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those people who welcomed Jesus as their king almost 2,000 years ago laid their coats in his path to signify, I surrender my life and everything I own to you, Jesus. But Jesus made an even greater show of love than that. See, riding that donkey over those palm branches and over their clothing, he signified he accepted the position of king. Think about what that means. In accepting the position as king, he willingly 
accepted the events that led him to the throne, which included torture, humiliation, and death on a cross. A horrible way to die. Jesus knew what was coming. But he loved us so much, he agreed to go through it all just so that we could experience that river of joy that God wants to bring to us. And just as they did on the original Palm Sunday, we need to repent and surrender everything in our lives to make Him our King. James 4. James talks about this. Keep in mind, James was Jesus' brother. Listen to what he wrote. So then, surrender to God. Stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will turn and run away from you. Move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer to you. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure. And stop doubting. Feel the pain of your sin. Be sorrowful and weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning. And your joy into deep humiliation. Be willing to be made low before the Lord. And He will exalt you. When was the last time you repented. I mean really grieved, mourned over your sin and begged God for forgiveness. I'm afraid so many people take for granted God's grace. And even when they do Ask God for forgiveness. It's with the attitude, eh, I know I need to stop doing this stuff that makes God angry, but I'll just ask Him to forgive me and it'll be okay. And so they ask forgiveness, but they don't do it with any type of grief over what they've done. James says that's not good enough, people. Grieve, mourn over your sin. Feel the pain that God feels and be sorrowful. When was the last time you dedicated and committed every part of your life to God? I mean every part. Everything you wish you had, hand that to Him. All of your money Let Him deal with that. Stop trying to get the nice things you want. Trust God to give you what you need. I've heard Christians make excuses for even stealing because they say, well, it's something I really want, so... That's not trusting God. Let's make this a matter of prayer this week too. Wednesday and Thursday. I want you to spend your prayer time in repentance. Take the time that you have set aside to spend with God on Wednesday and Thursday and repent. I mean, really grieve. Feel the pain of your sin. Ask God to help you lay everything down, everything in your life, down in the path in front of Him so that He can pass over it and forgive you. All right. 
All right, so we have already talked about the first two things we need to experience the river of joy. We must believe, we must repent. Here's the last point for today. To experience the river of joy, you must obey. You got to believe, you got to repent. But on top of all that, you have to obey. If you know the Easter story, you may have noticed that this crowd didn't follow through with their convictions. In in, uh, our adult Sunday school class this morning, we talked about the commitment that you make to God, to His kingdom, to His church, when you become a Christian. You make a commitment to God. But how many people actually follow through on that commitment? That's the problem. That's why we have so many empty seats in church. It's not that there aren't a whole lot of people out there that call themselves Christians. It's that they don't follow through with their convictions. Just like these people on the first Palm Sunday after shouting, Hosanna! And labeling Jesus as their king. And making that commitment to Him. A few days later, they were shouting, kill him, crucify him, and demanding from the governor that a convicted terrorist take his place as their leader. Wow. Talk about not following through on your commitment. How many people today have that same mentality? They want to be saved from sin and death. And when they realize Jesus is the way, they cry out, Hosanna! Save me! But then temptation comes. Now all of a sudden, Jesus is no longer king. They kick him off the throne of their lives. And they give sin control instead. You know, the only thing that God wants from us is our obedience. John 14, 23, Jesus answered, If a person really loves me, he will keep my word. Obey my teaching. I want you to follow what Jesus says here next. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home, our abode, our special dwelling place with him. This is why we teach people to invite Jesus into your heart. Because what Jesus said is, if you love me, you'll obey me. And if you do that, my Father is going to love you so much, He and I are just going to move right in. We're going to make your heart where we live, our home. Did you see what he said? If you love him, you'll obey him. And if you obey him, Jesus and God will come and live in you. And if God lives in you, you become that city that has a river of joy flowing into it. That's what Psalm 46.4 was talking about. Because Jesus said... If you will obey Him, if you love Him enough, if you believe in Him, you repent, and you will obey Him, God is going to make your life His city. And that river of joy will be flowing into you. See, ever since Adam and Eve chose to sin in the Garden of Eden, God has desired to restore the relationship He had with people before sin entered the picture. The truth is, we don't deserve God's love or His mercy. 
But he created us for the purpose of pouring his incredible love and joy into us. And and he never takes his love away. It's we who walk away from him. And we lose the source of joy. Deuteronomy 5.29, God said this, What I wouldn't give if they'd always feel this way, continuing to revere me and always keep all my commands. They'd have a good life forever. They and their children. In order to restore his relationship with us that was lost due to sin, God decided to place all of his essence, of his godly nature, into a human body. And because he was sinless, Jesus could offer himself as the innocent sacrifice for the sin of humanity. On the cross, Jesus paid the debt that we owe for sin, which the Bible tells us is death. So that we wouldn't have to pay that penalty. And because the penalty was paid in full, we have been given eternal life in God's presence. He has answered our prayer, Hosanna, save us! In a greater way than we could ever have imagined. He's given us the ability. Listen closely. He has given us the ability to never die. To live forever. See, in our finite human minds, we think of death as when this body stops. That's not death, my friends. That's not the death that God talks about. The death that He is talking about. The death that Jesus saved us from is an eternal separation from God in hell. And Jesus saved us from ever having to experience that. That's why He said we will live forever. That life doesn't start when this one is done, when this body gives up. That life begins when you accept that free gift of eternal life. So you are living it now. You never have to die. And all God asks in return is you love Him enough to obey Him. You want to experience that river of joy? You must believe. You must repent. And you must obey. Friday and Saturday this week, I want you to spend your time with God making sure you're obeying Him. Ask Him, God, is there anything that I am doing that angers you? Anything I'm doing that I shouldn't be? Or how about this? Not only not doing bad things, hey, God, is there anything that I should be doing that I'm not? Are you doing all the good things that God wants you to do? Lay everything in your life before Him. Just like those people laid palm branches and coats in front of Jesus. 
on that original Palm Sunday. Make Him your King. Over and over, continue laying your life down on that road in front of Him. Every time you pick it back up and you take control again, lay it down again. God promises to forgive you. Got a little more serious video here to end this service. Philip and Andrew's version of what happened back then. Take a look. What a crazy week. Crazy. We didn't even know if we were coming or going. Well, I mean, I did. You probably didn't, but I did. You knew nothing. I knew something was happening big time. Anyway, we're with Jesus, and the whole town just seemed to turn upside down. Uh, the feast was in full swing. The Passover was happening, and everybody was talking about Lazarus being raised from the dead. Oh, oh tell them about it. I mean, there was tons of miracles that people were talking about. Who's telling the story? What? I'm just trying Who's to help. Who's telling the story? I thought I would just help... So many miracles surrounding Jesus this Passover. Plus, on top of that, there was this time where Jesus came into the town on a colt, and everybody was going crazy, throwing down palm branches and all this. And uh, I mean, <laughs> it was it was nuts. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> Sorry. So many miracles. So many people believing that he was actually the king that we were all waiting for. There was even one Pharisee that was overheard saying, um, this is out of control. It's like the whole world is in a stampede over him. <laughs> stampede? Who says that? If you keep interrupting, I swear I'm going to get all Elijah on you. Oh, I'd like to see you try. Oh, no, not right now. Finish. Just, just go. And then there was these Greeks, basically Gentiles, that came up to me and they wanted to see Jesus. Greeks, more like geeks if you ask me. What are you saying? I'm Greek. Nothing. Please tell the story. I didn't know what to do, so I went to Andrew. See, I'm not just a pretty face. He needs me. Yeah, I needed you. I needed you to throw under the bus in case this went terribly wrong. So we went to Jesus, gave him the request, and it was as if Jesus didn't even hear us talking. Yeah, yeah. It was really weird. I mean, it was like... Uh, it was like we were little kids that uh, didn't understand what was going on, and Jesus was a parent trying to explain it to us, you know? And he's, oh yeah, he said, uh, he said, who's up? Who's up for the Son of Man to be glory filled? No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he, he did. Like, who's he up? Said. Who's up for the Son of Man to be glory filled? That's not the way I said it. But you meant. It's not what I. He didn't say that. He said, it's time. It's time for the Son of Man to be glorified. It was implied in what I said. Uh -huh. You made me lose my place. Uh -huh. um, uh. Jesus started talking about the sprout, how it needed to be buried underneath the ground and for it to be reproduced. We all knew what he was talking about. He was talking in code again. He was talking about himself. He was talking about his death. In all honesty, we just didn't get the full picture. I did. I, I did. I, I really... I mean, I didn't understand it completely, right? But uh, I remember because he said, if you, if you try to hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you let go of your life, you get e eternal life. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that sound? Yeah. I mean, it was God. Yeah. It was God. Some people in the room thought it was thunder. Some people thought it was angels. But it was God. Jesus got through talking, and then God said... It is glorified, and I will glorify it again. Yeah. Yeah, and then Jesus said, um, that, uh, that voice wasn't for me, it was for you. You need to listen. Yeah. I think the thing that keeps playing back in my mind is when Jesus then said, if you want to serve me, then follow me. What is the value if you, if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? And then he said, take up your cross. He said, take up your cross and follow me. I forgot about that. 
I forgot he said that. That <laughs> He was preparing us. He knew how this whole thing was going to end. It wasn't the end. It was just the beginning for all of us. <laughs> what a crazy week. What a crazy week. What a crazy week. As the worship team comes up and we end this service today, I just want to remind you, Psalm 46.4 tells us there is a river of joy flowing into the place where God lives. So if He lives in you, His joy will be there. You know, honestly, there's not too much standing between a life of misery and a life of abundant joy. Just believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, and live a life of obedience to God. And you can turn your misery into joy. God will make His home in your heart, and He will bring a river of joy into you. Doesn't that sound good? Will you stand while we say a prayer in closing? before we sing a final song. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you have taught us. Thank you, God, for providing this river of joy through Jesus. His death on the cross that covered all of our sins and paid the debt that we owe. Jesus, thank you so much for that and for coming back to life and leaving those sins where they belong in hell. God, help us not to pick those back up and put them back to life in us. Help us to leave them dead where Jesus left them. And God, every time we find ourselves bringing those sins back to life, help us to remember what Jesus did, to believe in that, to repent of our sins, and to obey you and lay those sins back in the grave, in hell, so that we can stand before you pure because of Jesus' sacrifice. Help us to show you our love through our obedience. God, be with us. Let your Holy Spirit come and live in us and bring us that river of joy that you promised. In Jesus' name.